Chapter 3 The Lily Baby felt a joggle on her arm, a tickle on her nose, and warm sun on her face. She squinted up at fingers standing over her, waggling a blade of grass like a magic wand. Wake up, I'm hungry. Flory fingers, baby sister, since they toddled round Limehouse, clinging to mole skirts, could be a grumpy little so-and-so. Baby had been dreaming about Mole and the crash and clatter of the docks, so it took her a mem- moment to remember that they weren't in London, not any more, but Netterfield, where the train had brought them the night before, not far from some other docks at Southampton. Baby stood up. A green silk jacket hung heavy with the damp of the morning dew. Fingers, on the other hand, was covered to her knees in a thick black workman's jacket. A badge... A green train outlined in brass with Southern Railway, where the, where the rail should be, glinted on the lapel. Like your coat, nice badge too, said Baby. Found it, didn't I? Fingers brushed some invisible specks off the lapel where the railway badge was pinned. Fingers only ever found stuff. Let's go and find some grub and a barrel to kip in tonight, said Baby. When they arrived the evening before, they were so tired that they fell asleep at the top of a grassy bank outside the station, which was where Fingers had just woken Baby up. On one side of her, a train chuffed into the station across the railway bridge, and on the other side, in the distance, Baby could see the town and its shops. But in front of her, at the bottom of the bank, and facing her from the other side of the road, between the railway bridge and the tram shed, was a prison. It had to be. Behind high railings and even higher gates, with a heavy-looking chain and padlock wound through them, stood a large building. Scraggy bushes dotted the grounds, and two rows of tall, darkened windows stretched between the towers at each end of the building broken only by an unwelcoming door in the middle. All baby's hope drained away, and she felt so sorry for anyone who had the misfortune to be locked up in there. So instead of rolling down the grassy bank, which was very tempting, baby took Finger's hand, pulled her away from the prison and down the hill to where a tram, heading into the town, had at that moment left the shed. On their way to the shops, and hopefully a pub with a spare barrel, Baby told Fingers more about the black shirt Toff, the horrible woman with the car, Sophie, her rescuing angel, and why they couldn't go anywhere until they rescued her back. If it weren't for her, I'd have been a goner, said Baby. But what about catching the boat, said Fingers. Soon, Baby lied. Fingers had been desperate to set sail for America ever since Moll had told them about the tall buildings, the bright lights and pickings like you'd never seen. But it wasn't only the pickings. Just the idea of America smoothed out the little lines of worry that often creased her sister's forehead. And now that Moll had gone, not to America but to heaven, it was up to Baby to be the ma and get them there. Eventually. Fingers' shoulders slumped even lower with the weight of it all. She lagged behind, dragging her boots along the pavement. They passed big houses set back from the street, a sooty old traction engine trundling along, and a vicar in his billowy white dress. She's here, said Baby. This place ain't big like London. We'll find her soon enough. How she willed that to be true. But what are we going to do with her when we when we have? She's not coming to, is she? Baby turned round, ready to tell Fingers off for being so mean. But when she saw how the grumpy frown on her sister's face had dissolved into a look so lost, it made Baby's heart ache. I don't know, she said, and put her arm round Fingers' shoulders like Moll used to. But Fingers shook herself out from underneath it. Tell you what, said Baby, if we ain't found her in a few weeks, say, I don't know, six weeks, 
that's all. If we not found her, all that black shirt toff that took her by then will find a ship at Southampton and stow away from there. How about that? We'll probably find her and send her on away long before then. Baby really wanted to believe that. But in those life-saving moments, not even a whole day ago, she gained another sister. And asking her to choose between them would be like asking a ma to choose between her kids. Fingers dragged the back of her hand under her nose and sniffed. You promise? I promise. Baby sounded as sure as sure, but the thought of leaving Sophie behind squeezed her heart. Fingers, with a bounce back in her step, strode past Baby. Well, let's get on with it then. And bold as you like, she skipped up the front path of the next big house. Come on, this here looks as likely a place as for any toff. Come on, this here looks as likely a place as any for the toff. Hang on, called Baby. But all she could do was run behind and do her best to stop her sister getting nabbed. Luckily or unluckily, Baby couldn't decide. They didn't find a toff in any of the big houses. They did find people who screwed up their noses and shooed the two girls off their doorsteps. And nobody who'd seen a girl that fitted Baby's description of Sophie's golden Goldilocks hair. It was early afternoon when Baby and Fingers reached the shops. Outside of greengrocers, they passed a girl about the same age as Sophie, Baby reckoned, but not golden at all. This girl had mousy brown hair, gangly arms and legs and was scrambling all over the pavement, picking up spuds. In the town centre, shopkeepers were, shopkeepers were turning their signs to close for dinner and winding up their awnings. A woman with shiny red cheeks stood in a baker's doorway and, mu- doorway and muttered something about filth when Baby and Fingers walked past. Baby wanted to hide. She pulled her sleeves over her hands and lowered her face. There was definitely more than one black shirt here. On the other side of the street, she saw a blue lamp above the door of a police station. Coppers weren't known for standing up for the likes of her and fingers, so Baby turned smartly away, up an alley next to a big shop. This way, she said, as if she knew where she was going. In a pet shop window, A little white dog was yapping desperately to be let out. Ahead, though, a pub sign creaked in the breeze. The Baker's Bonnet, read Baby. Underneath the sign, not a barrel, but a dustbin without its lid, was rolling around on the pavement, while plinky-plonk piano music, laughing, and the chink of glasses escaped through the door. I'm really hungry now, Fingers riffled through her skirts, but could only find a couple of bruised apples. I'm going to get some more grub, she said, and disappeared down the alley towards the street with the shops. Watch out for yourself, called Baby, but her burgling sister was gone. The pub music had turned to clapping and cheering, so Baby tipped the pin upside down under a window and climbed on top. Through the window, she saw a well-fed young woman in a slinky evening dress with satin roses round the neck climb up onto a sturdy table in the middle of the saloon. Her short hair set in ripples covered one eye. She looked dressed up for a night out, but it was only early afternoon. She swished a feather boa round her neck and began to sing at the top of her voice to a tune an old lady was bashing out on the piano. The old men in the pub clapped and cheered. They threw pennies and apennies at her feet. Then, in the middle of the song, she hitched up her dress and started dancing, her feet tapping on the table like Ginger Rogers. The old lady at the piano bounced and wobbled on her stool with the music as more coins clattered across the table and rolled through the smattering of stored sawdust that covered the floor. One of the younger men started picking up the money for himself, but when she saw him, the young woman leapt off the table and pushed him away so hard he stumbled backwards into an old man with a full pint glass frothing at his lips. The beer splashed the old man's muffler, 
and another one of the older men shook his fist, which the young man took exception to, and he shook his fist back. The young woman scooped up the rest of the coins off the floor and with a little shiver dropped them down the front of her dress. She got back up on the table and started singing and dancing again while the lady at the piano bashed out some more music. Very soon, fists, beer and bar stools were being hurled round them. The landlord, a big man with hair greased flat to his head and a long dirty white apron tied round his belly and a cigarette bouncing on his bottom lip, grabbed the young woman, not much more than a girl really, lifted her off the table and walked her through the uproar to the door. The old lady carried on playing through the cries of shame, shame, but nobody was bothered about that for long because another man leaned against the piano, conducting with two fingers as the old lady stuck, struck up a new song. Knees up, Mother Brown. Knees up, Mother Brown. The pub door flew open, and the girl tumbled out, ending up on her hands and knees in the alley. The landlord stood behind her on the step with his fists on his hips. I've had enough of your cheek. He, look, he took his cigarette between two fat fingers and pointed back inside the pub. I could get into a lot of trouble having you here. I'm doing it out of the goodness of my heart. So you take what you're given and clear off for today. The same young man who tried to pinch the girl's money grinned over the landlord's shoulder. He slipped out round the landlord's bulk and sauntered away, whistling a tune with his hands in his pockets. And I'll be docking your wages for the damages anyway, added the landlord, blowing smoke into the alley. The girl stood up. Her dress was dirty. A satin rose hung by a thread and her boa made, li- made a little pool of feathers by her feet. That wasn't my fault, she said, in a posh voice like you heard up west. Bill Teasdale started it. She pointed at the cocky, muscular young man disappearing down the alley. But the landlord wasn't taking any notice. Take it or leave it. He flicked ash off the end of his cigarette and retreated through the door, closing it behind him. The girl hammered on the door with her fist. Why are you blaming me? I told you it was Bill Teasdale and you've let him off scot-free. Baby saw fingers dodge the cocky young man and run back up the alley with what Baby hoped was a bag of buns screwed up in her fist. What's up with her? Fingers waggled the paper bag at the well-fed, satiny girl who suddenly became aware of Baby and Fingers gawping at her like she was a sideshow. She got chucked out of there, whispered Baby, nodding towards the pub door. And bold as you like, Fingers said, We're looking for a barrel to kip in for the night. Got any round here? A barrel? Baby moved Fingers gently aside. We just got here. Had a bit of trouble in London. Oh, I know about trouble, said the posh girl. That beast of a landlord. Look, I love to dance. Who doesn't? But just because I'm a day or two under age, he thinks he can push me around. The girl inspected her dress and tried to fix the rose on its thread back in position. But it wouldn't say, it wouldn't stay. Oh dear, another one gone for a Burton. Baby took off her green silk jacket. Like to borrow this? She draped it round the girl's shoulders. Oh, I say, thank you. Yes, better keep decent. Netterfield has some sniffy sorts. The girl put her arms through the sleeves, but she couldn't do baby's jacket up. Her gaping neckline was still on show. Oh, never mind, darling. I didn't lose the puppy fat, did I? She stroked the embroidered flowers that decorated the green silk as she handed it back to baby. This is rather splendid. Was it your mother's? It's always been mine, said Baby, putting her jacket on again. So do you know where we we can find a barrel? To kip in, added Fingers. Oh, I can do much better than that. She flung her feathers round her neck and strode away from the pub and the street with all the shops out the other end of the alley. It's this way, darlings. Tally-ho!